my name is Michelle Morand, and I am a cancer care advocate and educator. And I'm here today with Alexander Rowland, who is a precision oncology research specialist. Today, we're here to talk about specifically something to do with prostate cancer. But what Alex is about to share with you, a lot of this data does translate to many types of cancer. And we're talking specifically about surgery. If you have metastatic cancer or of multiple types, you've been told perhaps that surgery isn't an option for you. While this conversation is specific to prostate cancer, what Alex is going to share will be helpful to you as well. I wanted to start out, I got a little PowerPoint presentation, but first I want to give you a a bit of a background on where this new approach is coming from. During the early years of cancer research, what researchers would do is they would take a human tumor and they would cut it out and they would put it in an animal. And then they would treat that animal with various drugs. And it's still commonly used today, this approach. But they found that they couldn't get these tumors to grow in the animals unless they took out a certain size of tumor. So if they just took out a small piece of the tumor, it wouldn't grow. And they found that they had to take out a fairly large piece of tumor containing a lot of cells. And later on, what they found out was that it was actually the stem cells. These are cells, they're called adult stem cells. These are the cells that actually create the cancer. What happens is these cells are in, in our bodies everywhere and they repopulate certain tissues as we go through our life and as uh, new tissues are needed. And so what they're finding out is if they took out a small amount of tumor tissue, then they probably were missing the stem cells. So the stem cells are typically, you know, one in six million cells. So one stem cell could produce, you know, six million different cells, tumor cells. And so you have to have a stem cell in order for the tumor to be able to regrow in a different position. And so now we know that really it's only the uh, cancer causing stem cells, the mothership cell, as we call it, that can actually metastasize. So that was an important study. The second finding that happened many, many years ago was when they were growing tumors in Petri dishes, they noticed that there would be this uh, area around the tumor where there was all these different growth hormones and uh, you know different uh, cell types and so on. And they call that the tumor microenvironment. But what was really interesting is they could take the washings from the tumor microenvironment, in other words, just the, the median that it was grown in, the liquid that it was grown in and uh, that surrounded the tumor, and they could put normal cells into that median and it would turn them into cancer cells. So mm -hmm. that really helped us understand why surgery is so important is number one, when you do surgery, if you can remove the, the stem cells with the tumor, then you're going to have a much better chance of that cancer not coming back and not being able to spread. Additionally, you're removing that growth medium, which is the what we call the tumor microenvironment, and that can be transforming too. So in many different cancers, you can have the tumor, the primary tumor removed, even after there's metastasis. They refer to that as debulking. But for some reason in prostate tumors, that hasn't really caught on. And I'm going to explain why and why it's important. So an important question when planning treatment for cancers is whether to remove the primary tumor. If you have metastatic disease, typically doctors don't want to remove the prostate tumor or the prostate. And the argument that the doctors typically use is that it's not going to make a difference since the disease is already spread. You know, it's already spread outside of the prostate. So therefore, removing the prostate is not going to have a big impact. And additionally, they have many different ways of killing the tumor within the prostate. It's called ablation. And it can be done with radiation therapy, uh, you know, brachytherapy, where they insert little radioactive rods around it, you know, a variety of different ways you can kill it. Proton therapy, high frequency ultrasound. So in a lot of cases, you know, doctors think, well, you know, we'll just, we'll just kill the tumor within you. We don't need to go through surgery. However, we do know for many different types of cancers, removing the primary tumor, even after metastasis, can really slow things down. And, you know, case examples are from melanoma. Uh, renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer, a colorectal cancers, gastric cancers, you know, removing that primary tumor allows the patient to live much longer, even when they're metastatic. So why is it not removed in prostate? Traditionally, with advanced disease, there can be a lot of complications with removing the prostate. The prostate is heavily vasculated, so it's not a simple surgery. If you have extension of the tumor into uh, different areas like the rectal wall or seminal vesicles, then it can really complicate surgery. However, we do have new techniques. We have the robotic surgery, uh, which is very effective, um, and it allows doctors to really go in and accurately 
remove pieces of tumor and, you know, when it's spread, you know, we do have these new techniques. So I think there's a bit of this older philosophy that has failed to die along with the new technologies. Meaning we now have the ability to do much better. And so some of the reasons why we might not have recommended this before, like the possible consequences of the surgery really yeah. aren't a concern with this new type of surgery. Exactly. There are, you know, great forms like ablation, external beam radiation, targeted radiation, bracket therapy, and many doctors feel that they're equivalent, but they don't, number one, typically target the stem cells that cause the tumor, which can be a few centimeters away from the actual tumor. And then they don't also, they don't remove the tumor microenvironment. And those are the big factors there. Yeah. As you were saying that, that the microenvironment itself is sufficient to make cancer happen. Yes, exactly. That's tra- it's called transformation from a normal cell to a cancerous cell. However, science data across many different types of cancers and in general shows that you can greatly improve benefits of removing the primary tumor. Uh, one of them is decreased tumor burden. That means how, many, how much of the cancer you have in your body. Immune modulation. So the primary tumor has a bunch of antigens and has, has an opportunity to create metastasis around the entire body. Whereas a metastasis in the lung may not be able to metastasize from the lung to a different part of the body. Or, you know, if it does, it's going to be a lot harder. Whereas the primary tumor has the ability to metastasize to many different locations. And also there's a certain amount of interaction with the primary tumor with the immune system. So the immune system does go in to target the primary tumor, but it gets disabled by one of probably about 14 different pathways. We have drugs for some of those pathways now, like the PD-1 pathway and the CTLA-4 pathway, but we don't have drugs for a lot of the other pathways. But the important thing is you get this immune response. Also, you have an improved response to secondary treatments because you don't have this primary tumor that's spitting out uh, tumor cells all around the body. And additionally, by removing the primary tumor, you avoid Uh, secondary complications, such as, you know, local growth of the tumor into the surrounding areas that can, that can complicate treatments. So data. Now the problem is, is the data. It's very difficult to create a clinical trial and say to these people, you know, well, for you, we're going to remove your tumor. And for you, we're going to not remove it, but we're going to treat you both the same way. The problem is, is every person's cancer is unique. And so these trials don't really stratify the patients properly. So you can't match this trial or this person's case with this person's case and this person's case, unless you do a full molecular analysis. In other words, unless you look at all of the DNA and the RNA genes expressed in each case, and then put those patients in a trial where you do two arms of, you know, one with removal and one without. And that's just never been done. We don't stratify our patients that well. And so there's going to be a difference in these trials uh, between tumor grade, the unique molecular features, like whether they have a P10 deletion or not, or whether they have uh, angiotin receptor alterations. Uh, there's so many different variables that can affect how a person responds to treatment and how, the, how aggressive their cancer is. And then there's also timing of treatments. So we learned from the PEACE-1 trial, typically prostate cancer is treated uh, sequentially. So you have ADT, and then if your PSA goes up, you know, ADT stands for angiogen deprivation therapy. And if that stops working, then they add what's called an angiogen receptor antagonist. And then when that stops working, they give you a chemotherapy. And after that, there's not a lot of treatment options in standard care. So what we've discovered with the PEACE-1 trial is if you have a bulky disease, if you have a high-grade disease, and you get the ADT, the angiogen receptor antagonist, and the chemotherapy all at the exact same time early on, after diagnosis, you have a much longer survival than you do if you were doing those sequentially as they're done commonly. So, you know, timing of treatments makes a big difference. So, you know, one patient may have had his chemo and everything early and another patient may have not had it until, you know, seven or eight years later. So that's going to change things. And then uh, obviously how well the treatment is matched to a patient. You know, if a patient in this trial has a mutation in their angiogen receptor, then obviously they're not going to respond to angiogen receptor antagonists. And therefore, um, their course of disease is going to be very different regardless of whether they have their tumor taken out or ablated. So these things have complicated the data. So what are the benefits of it? Um, Once again, as a summary, it removes the tumor microenvironment. It reduces overall tumor burden. But most importantly, when you remove the primary primary tumor, the primary tumor is actually a ball of cells. And these cells are going to have different areas of subpopulations. 
So they're not all going to be the same. Mm -hmm. um, this ball of tumor cells in the prostate in the primary tumor is going to actually have a bit of heterogeneity. In other words, it's going to contain cells that are driven by certain molecular features in this part of the tumor. And then in the other part of the tumor, it's going to have completely different molecular features. And then in this part of the tumor, it's going to have completely different molecular features. Each one of those different areas of the tumor can grow a subpopulation of cells that is going to be resistant to treatments given to tumors or treatments that target the other subpopulations. That's what we call tumor heterogeneity. And it's a big problem in late stage cancers. So when you remove that primary tumor, you remove the ability for that tumor to create a bunch of different subpopulations and to create heterogeneity that will complicate treatments down the road. And that's a major driving factor in removing the primary tumor. And then, as I mentioned also, the primary tumor is different from metastasis and contains unique molecular features. Removal versus ablation, you know, which is right for you? Well, I think that can be looked at in many different ways. But right now, many times we'll have a patient that's just not responding well to treatments and we'll, we'll have them get something called a PSMA PET scan. And uh, when we get them this PET scan, we'll often see, oh, you haven't had your, your prostate out. You know, yes, but the doctor radiated it many years ago and said it was dead. And we'll look and we'll see lots of activity in the prostate still. And so the prostate, although it's been radiated and supposedly killed, has actually been reactivated and is now spitting out tumor cells. And that's a problem. So in those cases, we want to have the prostate removed. And so this PSMA PET scan, I'm sure you've heard of it before. And if you haven't, we've got some excellent videos on it. In short, uh, PSMA is a membrane antigen. It's called the prostate-specific membrane antigen. An antigen is something on the outside of a cell, and it tells uh, other cells, including the immune system, what type of cell that is. So it provides information. It also triggers antibodies against that too. So in other words, if a prostate cell is somewhere else in the body, it's not supposed to be there. And the immune system can recognize that by looking at the PSMA molecule. So most prostate cells, whether they're cancerous or not, have PSMA overexpression. So the PSMA imaging is a great tool. It'll identify active growing prostate cells anywhere in the body. So we had a recent case where a patient was not responding to anything. Young man, he had a very aggressive cancer. He had the P10 deletions and we got him a PSMA PET scan. Interestingly enough, we saw activity in his prostate still, even though his prostate had been completely ablated and also in the lymph nodes around his prostate, which were not there before. And this told us that that prostate was not only still active, but it was still taking part in the metastatic process because the lymph nodes near the prostate were actually active and full of tumor cells. Perfect case example of this person should have had their prostate removed a long time ago, but we're told it was not going to benefit them. And clearly it's a problem. In this particular case, we advocated for the patient and we got them surgery elsewhere and we got them robotic surgery. It was a simple process. Um, we just had to get them to the right doctor that read the scan and said, oh yeah, this patient needs his prostate out right away. And so we we're able to do that uh, based on this PSMA scan in this particular case. Which will fundamentally give this person much more time. Yeah, because their prostate was actively contributing to their metastasis. Right. And they had no other metastasis in any other organ except for the bones and, and some lymph nodes. Mm. So, you know, prime time to get that prostate out. Also, the person's PSA dropped significantly as soon as we got this surgery. Alex mentioned a PSMA PET scan as a great way to identify as a prostate cancer patient how important is surgery for me specifically. The PSMA PET scan is the way to assess that. We can certainly help you coordinate one. It's a fairly new technology and certainly new-ish to certain countries. And so sometimes doctors won't have heard of them. Sometimes they really won't appreciate the benefit of them and might tell you not to bother. But I think Alex has done a really great job of explaining why this scan is so important, specific to prostate cancer. And if you just want to have somebody that knows what they're talking about in this regard, have a look at your medical records, everything that's already known about your case, been done about your case, and do some reviewing about you specifically and the most beneficial treatments for you specifically. That's what happens in the consultation where you'll meet with Alex for an hour on Zoom after he has reviewed your medical history and he and his team have identified the next best steps for 
for you and you get a written report and all sorts of good stuff. So that link will take you to more information about that consultation process. I highly recommend it because that way you know exactly what's possible. The fullest extent of science-based medicine can be brought to bear in your case. And what Alex has shown us already is that the more thorough and accurate your diagnosis and the more with that piece one study, really what it showed is, you know, that that timing, everything that can be done, the sooner it gets done, the better for you. So I think that piece one study was really, really important because the three tenets of precision oncology are the right drug for the right patient at the right time. The timing is important. And that's what that showed exactly. In Canada, it's very common. This is where we're located, although we do provide support to patients all around the world. Here, I hear patients saying all the time, oh, my doctor said, well, the cancer is metastasized, so I can't have surgery. And then the same patient might hear, oh, well, you know, your your treatment is working now, so you, know, you, so you can't have surgery. We ha- had a consultation with somebody yesterday who had that very hair-pulling experience where at one point... Her cancer was perceived by her doctor as being too sizable for surgery. Now that the tumor had shrunk because of a treatment that we helped access, the doctor is saying that the surgery isn't necessary. Well, there's still a tumor there. And as Alex is saying, this microenvironment is important. So anyway, we're advocating we'll get surgery for this patient. The point is you might be told there's no point in surgery. You don't need surgery. It's not going to benefit you. Or we don't normally do surgery here. Or let's just watch and wait. And then, you know, we can do surgery later if need be. Too often I speak to people whose doctors gave them that advice and then they miss this very precious window that Alex is talking about to to get that cancer removed, to prevent that heterogeneity, to prevent that spread. We don't want that to be you. So if uh, you've asked about surgery and you've been told no, not for you, give us a call and let's find out if perhaps there might be a way for us to help advocate with your doctor to get surgery for you or to help coordinate a surgery elsewhere for you if it's appropriate. All right. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for sharing this information. That was really helpful.